Hey, this is Seth, and in this video, I'm going to talk about how to become a digital nomad the right way. I've been living here in Thailand on this island, this beautiful island for the past two years, working from my laptop. Um, I'm able to manage and handle all my US-based business while I'm living overseas. It's been a wonderful experience, and I definitely recommend it if it's something that you are dreaming about or are passionate about. And it's never been more realistic or possible to actually be a digital nomad as it is right now. Remote work has skyrocketed, things are opening back up, it's possible to travel, and you know you can do it, you just need to know the right steps to do it. So in this video, I'm basically gonna talk about how, how to do this, and it's not that complicated, but you do need to plan things out and know how everything works. Now to be a digital nomad, the first thing you need is to be a digital worker of some kind. You actually need to be able to earn income through the internet, through either a remote job or freelancing or your own online business. That's what gives you the ability to travel without having to go into an office. And I'm going to talk about that in detail. But first, before you go there, you really do want to have a vision and a plan of where it is you want to live and where you want to travel. You want to actually understand what it's going to be like, wherever it is you want to live, whether you're going to travel domestically or internationally, what it's like to live in that place. But you also want to understand the cost of living in wherever you're going to go. Because for some of you guys, like let's say you want to live in Southeast Asia, where I live. This is one of the reasons a lot of people live here is the cost of living is much, much lower than in the West, which means you don't have to work as hard. You don't have to work as many hours and your, you know, your income requirements are different. Now, if you want to, if your dream is to live in Paris, you have to work a lot harder and make a lot more money because the cost of living is a lot higher. So I'm going to kind of um, give you some insights on again how to determine that and also just how to get a sense of where it is you want to live before you actually go there. So I want to give you just a little more detailed guidance on researching destinations and it is so much easier to do this now than it ever was. I actually remember when I moved to Hawaii back in like 2005 I, I had to rely on a book. This is actually a great book. Um, one of the better books out there better than Lonely Planet or anything but I remember you used to have to just rely on a guidebook and now Thanks to Google and the internet, there's just so many more like four-dimensional ways to actually get a sense of where your your destination is going to be. The first thing is Google. Google is <laughs> any question you have, Google it. You will likely find an answer. But I'm going to give you a few more resor specific resources on top of that. Now, social networking sites. What I mentioned before, like with Facebook, literally, if I want to go to Medellin, Colombia, like literally, I just uh, I even misspelled Colombia. But I just um, typed that in, and I already saw that there's a ton of these Facebook groups. Medellin Expats, Medellin Expats, Columbia Insight, Tourist Info, uh, with thousands of members. And you can join very easily, and people in there are usually um, you know, sharing their experiences. Usually they're pretty helpful when people ask questions about what it's like to live there or they're thinking of moving there. And you know, social media is great for this. Facebook is great for this because, like, any city you can think of usually has a group like this. Um, another resource I want to recommend is this particular website, which is called Expat Den, and you can see they have uh, they have a lot of information about all these different countries, um, Western countries like France, Germany, Italy, and also other countries like Malaysia, Mexico, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, etc. And I found these guys have been around for a while. They talk about things like your, your moving guide, health insurance, the language, the visas, renting an apartment, sending money, all this stuff. Uh, and a lot of this information is free. They do have a premium subscription as well. But I think this is a really great place to, uh, this is a great resource, resource here. There is a site called Nomad List that a lot of people like. I actually haven't joined it myself. This is the place where I was talking about how they... Uh, give you estimates of the cost of living, but I think you should take it with a grain of salt and really get specific. Don't just look at their estimates and say, oh, that's what that, that's how much it costs. I mean, again, you can get a sense of things, but you really want to um, look at, for instance, with the apartments, you want to actually look at actual apartments and see the different prices. Actually, here's a good example of that. So I was going to talk about looking for um, rentals and apartments and places to live. Um, I googled apartment apartment rental Medellin. And I'm using Medellin just because obviously I've been in Thailand for a long time. I wanted to do something a little bit different. But let's say um, I, I Google it. The first result is this short and long-term furnished apartment rental place that is kind of pricey. You know, it's like 1,800 to 3,000 a month, um, more luxury style stuff or 1,000 to 1,500. Uh, 
it's a little bit pricey for living as a digital nomad, but it also looks quite nice. So I would go back, and again, it gives you a good sense of what's available. Now, I found that one of the, this, this um, I like this result, which was uh, from a blog called How to Expat. And you can see there's a lot of these people, people who have been expats in various countries will start blogs and make videos and give you a lot of good information that, you know, that they didn't have when they were starting out more than likely. Um, this guy's talking about the real estate market in Medellin. He talks about the paperwork involved, how to avoid getting scammed, uh, furnished apartments. Face, he's got examples of Facebook groups right here. That's actually another really good resource, and we have that here in Koh Samui too, is uh, city-specific Facebook groups for apartments. Um, so here's a really good example of like people looking for apartments and people who are renting apartments. You can do the same thing with pretty much any city. Chiang Mai Digital Nomads. Yeah, I have that Chiang Mai apartments rentals i just did this off the top of my head and you can see there's like a marketplace in facebook but there's also groups houses for rent in chiang mai and it's very similar uh type of group and they're all over the place uh so social media google these are all really great resources and then again what um this blog and again there's a lot of blogs out there uh, individual people sharing their experiences and they're talking about, for instance, for Medellin, they're talking about the costs of uh, apartments in various neighborhoods within Medellin. And this is also very, very good intelligence to have because, you know, you're going to learn, you want to learn about the cities that you want to visit. You want to learn about where you want to live, where you don't want to live in terms of cost and also in terms of the experience that you want to have. Um, unfurnished apartments, contracts and things like that. So then once you find someone like this, like, great, you can actually probably likely le reach out to this person or see what other uh, what other topics they're an expert uh, expert on. Um, and this is specifically for Colombia. So then you probably find blogs, you know, specifically about Thailand, about Vietnam and all these other things. If I type in like expat blog Thailand, you know, the Thailand life, there's a blog here. And then uh, actually you can find people this person's been living and traveling in Thailand for 14 years. And, you know, this is just a, a process. I'm just showing you how to get started. But this, there's just so many resources. The other thing is um, you can definitely, so we got Nomad List. You could also go to this website, Couchsurfing, which um, used to be free. Now I believe there is a fee to, uh, to join. But it's a really great social networking site where, where basically you will, uh, once you join, you can find people in various countries who are basically letting people crash on their couch. And the cool thing about once you crash on somebody's couch, do couch surfing is you're really getting to connect with a local um, and get their authentic insights into what it's like to live in whatever city you wanna go to. You can also go on Airbnb and not only use Airbnb to research the price of the housing in the place you want to go, but what I recommend is if you go to the experiences, like let's say I wanted to go to Rome, you can see all these experiences. And I found this one, Rome by Vespa with a local. There's a lot of these things where like a local is put up their gig on, all these people do, they live in Rome. So they're like, hey, I'm going to, I'll give people a tour. I don't, you don't need to pay some big tour company. I'll just, just pay me and I'll show you around Rome. We did that. I did that when I was in Japan and it was great. And you click on it and then you see your host, Angelo. And it talks about he grew up in Rome and then you can contact him. He's got an Instagram page and now you can get in touch. And you can actually, if you go to Rome, you can actually buy his gig and get to know him in person. But you can also ask him some basic questions just by clicking contact. And guys, it was never this easy to connect with people in other countries before the internet. It's absolutely amazing in my opinion, being someone from the old, <laughs> the old uh, pre-internet <laughs> pre world of the 1990s. Uh, the last two recommendations I was going to make. So I talked about blogs, uh, rental sites like the one we, t we talked about uh, before. Uh, that's, you know, most of the time if you Google, if I do rent apartment in Thailand, you're going to see probably this one, which is Thailand property. These, this is one of the biggest websites in Thailand and they have, you know, you can search by location and they have all sorts of rentals listed here. Um, so definitely, these are all great resources, blogs, experience sites like Airbnb, social networking. And what I was also going to talk about in terms of social networking is language. So there's two sites I recommend. One is called uh, italki. And this is actually where you can get one-on-one -on -one lessons with uh, language teachers in any country. And I've actually been doing this to learn Thai. Uh, but you can go, you know, you can learn English, French, Japanese, Italian. Well, you can learn like pretty much any language you can imagine. 
And the cool thing is, it's it's a networking site like Facebook, but the it helps you get introduced to the people a lot easier than just randomly messaging somebody on Facebook. Like if you want to go to, let's say I am learning, let's say I want to go to, um, I don't know, France. <laughs> I don't know, I picked France because I haven't picked that one yet. And then I would just, you know, let's see, I would look through here and I want to take a lesson with Celine or Edmund or one of these guys. And I would actually look, I can look and also see like, where do they live? So he's from France, but usually it gives you the city where they're from. Uh, but if you find uh, a teacher who lives in a city where you want to visit, you can not only potentially have a little language lesson, but also ask them some questions about the language itself. Um, it's just a great way to meet people and then with a common interest and it's a platform like, you know, again, it's like a dating site. It's a way of connecting people, but it's, it's specifically about learning languages. And actually, if you look at all the different languages here, we got Arabic, you got Esper Esperanto, nobody speaks that, or Chinese, uh, Hebrew, Icelandic, Indonesian, you know, like when I was learning Thai, I just clicked I am learning Thai and I could, you know, just look at all the different people. You can see how many reviews they've had. Um, you know, you can click on them and see where they live. They're living in Bangkok. And so if you're in the middle of the conversation or you can, you can even ask people say, hey, can I talk to you about, you know, what it's like to live there or you know, give me some advice or some resources, whatever you want to do. And on the same uh, token, there's an app called Tandem. And this is different just because this is not a, about lessons. So with italki, you do have to pay. But I'm telling you, the depending on what language you're learning, it can be really inexpensive. I know like I pay like $10 a lesson sometimes. With Tandem, it's just um, language uh, chatting, language exchange. Like you just want to practice speaking a language with another person. And again, if you're... If you're like going to England and you're from the U.S., I mean, you really can't do much. You both speak English. But if you want to practice, you know, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Korean, Chinese, Thai, whatever it is. I've met actually a couple of really cool people through this app just because they wanted to speak more English and I wanted to speak more Thai. And it's a really cool app to use. But anyways, once you get into the like once you realize that these apps exist, like now that I know what tandem is, I'm like, oh, my God, there's other apps like that. You can join those apps. And you can get, again, a really clear sense of what it's like to live in that place, whether you want to talk to an actual local who grew up there, who's a native of that country, or an expat who has relocated there. There's just so many opportunities to meet people through these various groups, whether it's the housing group or the expat group, or through these blogs or through couch surfing, whatever, you, whatever it is. There's so many websites you can use, and these are just some ideas, but I hope that this gives you some inspiration and some ideas of where to get started. Now, I started running my online business in 2016, and I took my first trip to Asia in 2017. I visited the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore. Um, and that was a great experience because I actually got to sample each of these countries. And after visiting each of these countries, which each one of them ha had wonderful qualities to them, but I really liked Thailand. And it was really great because I came back to the U.S., but when I decided to leave in 2019, I knew Thailand was going to be my home base because I had actually spent time there. The best thing you really can do if you're going to live internationally is actually visit the country that you're thinking of living in before you go there. Because you will really, you really, you know, you can read about it and you can think about it, but actually being there is a completely different experience. The other thing you want to consider is what kind of a digital nomad do you want to be? There's basically two types in my experience. Number one, there's people like my, a friend of mine who is always traveling. He is always traveling. He's always going to new places. He's always doing activities. And that is definitely an exciting way to live, but it's also very time consuming to do that much traveling and it's not very stable. And then the number two way is the way I do it is I've been living in the same villa for the last two years. So it's almost like in a way it's like I live in any other city, I just happen to live in another country on an island. Um, and you really want to think about that because traveling takes up a lot of time and energy, the planning, the packing, the actual travel itself. Um, and I think I've heard of some people getting burned out by being a digital nomad. And it's mostly because they are just moving too much rather than actually finding a place they like, setting up some roots, building a community, making some friends and things, which I've done here, which makes it much more sustainable. Basically, the more detailed your research is, the better you're going to feel as you move forward in your journey. Now, the other thing I've realized from talking to so many people over the years is that, you know, I actually lived in Hawaii when I was in my 20s, and I was not a digital nomad. I was just a bum. I didn't have any income, and I was always broke. But people would always ask me. I did, you know, I got jobs here and there, and I'd work at this big hotel, the Hyatt Regency, and people would say, how did you move to Maui? Like, how did you do it? And these are, like, successful people with money. And I realized, like, I said, well, I got on a plane. 
and people, a lot of their barriers are actually mental and psychological. This idea that you can't, you know, move around, you have to stay in one place. This is something that's now changing in the world as remote work has become more popular. But you just have to really dig into your own psychological barriers. Like, why can't, if you have a remote job, why can't you move? You know, is it a... Uh, do you, do you need to be in the office of your company? Do they have meetings once a month or something like that? Could you negotiate with your boss to go fully remote? Um, and the, the other thing that you usually have to deal with if you do have a remote job is scheduling. Like, yeah, if you, if you need to be available from 9 to 5 U.S. time and you're in Asia, that's a problem because Asia, in Asia it's going to be the middle of the night. But let's say you travel to South America, the time zone is nearly the same. If you're in Europe, you just end up you know, working from afternoon to late evening. It's all very manageable. So what in your own mind and heart is stopping you from being a digital nomad is something you want to examine. And the other thing is, of course, when you actually assess your cost of living in another country, you might get very excited because you're going to say, oh, my God, you know, I have to spend this much money to live in the U.S. But if I lived in uh, Chiang Mai or if I lived in uh, Kuala Lumpur or if I lived in Medellin, I could spend a quarter of that money and I'd need to work a lot less and everything would be a lot more manageable, which is one re another reason people like to be a digital nomad. Um, but you'll have a clear vision in your head and you'll know what kind of skill sets and what kind of uh, energy you have to put into earning money before you travel. So now I'm going to go into detail about the remote skill sets I recommend that you can use to earn income as a digital nomad. Now, I, I was just going to do a quick overview, but I ended up recording, like getting into this re really in depth. And I hope you enjoyed this part of the video and I hope it gives you a lot of ideas and some inspiration about what's possible when it comes to learn, earning money online. So now I just want to give you an overview of the kind of remote skill sets that you can acquire, how difficult it is to acquire them and the possible compensation you can get from these skill sets so you can understand how much money you could be making while you're traveling remotely and living as a digital nomad. Now, this is just a quick overview. There are so many skill sets, guys, so many remote jobs and freelance opportunities available now, especially after the pandemic. And I've broken this down to basically three tiers of difficulty and compensation, going from some, a job that would be relatively easy to get and wouldn't pay as much to one that's more difficult to get and requires more training. So I'm starting off here with tier one, which I would call low skill, low pay job that's easier to get into quickly but has lower compensation and requires really low brain power it's really the easiest way to put it and the two main skill sets here is basically just customer service and data entry now honestly this is what i did after college because i didn't have any actual <laughs> more high income skill sets um customer service you know answering phones talking to customers and data entry is typing in stuff and also general transcription which could be taking uh, audio or video conversations and typing out what people are saying. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities in this and you really don't need much additional training to know how to do this. If you go over to Upwork, which is a freelance marketplace where essentially these are not jobs, these are not salary jobs, these are gigs. These are like one-off um, jobs that companies need for people to do. You go over to transcription, you see there's 4,800 jobs, dictations, transcription. Uh, you can see like somebody wants someone to handle transcribing audio, meaning you have to listen to audio and just type out what people are saying. This is very basic stuff. And you can see the pay is not that great, eight to t uh, $12 an hour. Now, if you're in the US, I would be like, eh, this doesn't seem like a great opportunity, but this, this company's already spent a lot of money. They've already spent $80,000. Um, if you're living in a country in Southeast Asia, like Cambodia or Vietnam or Thailand, or if you're in Costa Rica or in South America, eight to $12 an hour is pretty good considering that your cost of living is so low. So that's, again, why I'm including this in the Digital Nomad video. Um, you can also go over to this website called Rev, which uh, is, I use them for my captioning, actually, and you can, you can be a transcriptionist or a captioner, and they pay you per uh, audio minute that you transcribe. And again, it's not a lot of money, but if you do, let's say, a 30-minute uh, video, and let's say you make a dollar per minute, that's 30 bucks. If you make less, if you make 50 cents, that's like 15 bucks. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's like uh, as I said, it's not a lot of brain power, but it definitely takes a lot of focus and it can be a bit tedious, but it is a way to make money remotely and uh, it's quite flexible. You basically just work whenever you want to work. And if you know a foreign language, you can actually make a lot more money. This is actually an opportunity where being a, you know, bilingual can really come in handy. Because remember guys, I'm not saying this should be your full time job, especially if you're living in Europe and the United States where the cost of living is very high. But if you're living in uh, a place with a relatively low cost of living, this can really, uh, you know, really make a difference. 
Um, customer service, obviously we probably all had customer service jobs. You can see that there are actually 83,000 remote digital marketing jobs, uh, not digital marketing, sorry, I say that I do so many digital marketing videos, uh, remote customer service jobs in the United States. And yeah, again, you could be making, even if it's only paying like $15 an hour in the US, uh, in US cur currency, um, if you're living overseas, that goes a lot further. Um, you can see there's uh, also data entry, which is just basically typing stuff into the computer. I have did data entry all through my 20s. Um, that's how I supported myself. There's 18,000 open jobs on, on Upwork. There's about 34,000 remote data entry jobs on LinkedIn. So yeah, there is definitely a lot of opportunity in these sort of tier one, as I call it, jobs, 8,000 customer service jobs, uh, gigs on LinkedIn. Now this is better because, you know, if you get a job, I will say that if it's a nine to five job, the challenge if you do go to Asia or Europe is that you will be in a different time zone than your company and you need to make sure that you can, that's, that's doable. But if you get a gig through Upwork, it's usually like a one-off thing. And especially a customer service versus transcription. Transcription is usually something you just do it on your own schedule versus customer service where, where you actually have to be available to talk to people. Oop, there's just jumping ahead there for a moment. Uh, so yeah, so this is again, this is really a good way to get income coming in, but it's not gonna make you a lot of money, but you may not need a, mon a lot of money depending on where you live. Now the last, uh, the last sort of low skill, low compensation um, skill set is uh, proofreader. Now, this uh, is basically, this is actually a real thing. Like people, you can see there's 5,000, this is remote jobs in the US, there's 5,000 remote jobs, there's 17,000 open jobs. And basically, anyone who does copy, you need somebody to double check and make sure you don't have errors. So this is actually a very valuable skill set. And some of you guys who are college graduates or you know how to write properly, you know proper spelling and grammar, etc. you know, good with details. This is something you could potentially do and you could potentially do it in a remote position. I'm also going to talk about this website in a little bit, Fiverr, which is another online marketplace like Upwork. But you can see here there's like people, you know, you can actually research Fiverr and uh, look for uh, services that people are offering that have a lot of reviews, which indicates there are people on this marketplace looking for things like proofreading services. Now, something you'll notice that like the top rated seller here is charging very, very little uh, proofreading a thousand words for 10 bucks, that's very, very low. Uh, that's not a lot of money. It's again why I put it in the low, in the really low income skill. This person is doing very well as well, charging a more respectable amount at $55. But again, I put it in here under the remote work because again, you're living overseas, you're paying a quarter of what you'd normally pay in living expenses, then this could still be a good idea. But uh, this is also why I do recommend that you look up to the next tier where you can actually increase your income by learning some very in-demand skills in a relatively short amount of time. Now let's talk about tier two, which is what I would call medium skills or mid-skill level with medium to high pay. This actually requires you to learn an in-demand skill set, but it, and it can be done in a period of months, not years. This is where you usually want to take an online course or a boot camp, something very efficient. Not, I'm not talking about going to college. I'm talking about getting relevant, efficient training. And it requires what I would say medium brain power, more brain power than like just typing stuff into a computer or talking to customers on the phone. And obviously my skill set of choice is digital marketing. You, if you, I'm not gonna get too much into it here because you can watch like literally all the videos on my channel are about digital marketing. But this is a skill set that, you know, I've had people from all different backgrounds. I've had artists, um, warehouse workers, engineers. Um, I've had realtors. I've had people from like every background you can imagine learn digital marketing and be able to apply it. Uh, with a lot of hard work, but it's not prohibitive. It's not like becoming a doctor or something where it's like so, takes so much time to learn and it's so mentally taxing. Um, it's a really great mixture of an analytics, analysis, and creativity. Yeah, and there are just so many jobs. So if you look at digital marketing in the United States, there's 246,000 open jobs. Um, technically, you're going to see that 68,000 of those are remote, according to LinkedIn, which is already a ton of jobs. But something I like to point out to people, I'll just get into this a little bit because I'm so passionate about this topic, is that you're gonna see jobs like this, digital marketing specialist splash Omnimedia. This is an agency that has been growing for a long time. They're always hiring. I, I do these walkthrough videos every month and I always see these guys. And this is an entry level role. They say minimum one year paid search experience. Um, 
again, which is what I teach you in my course is how to decipher these job postings. But basically, they want someone who knows about something called Google Ads, Google Analytics, Facebook advertising, which basically um, advertising using Google, using Facebook, or search engine optimization, which has to do with helping websites rank higher in Google search results, and a lot of these tools and platforms. Now, if you look down using LinkedIn Premium, you can see that out of the 27 people that have applied, most of them do not even have these skill sets. You've got leadership, customer service, Word, time management, and one, maybe one person has search engine optimization, but nobody has actual Google Ads or analytics experience, meaning you are going to be a standout candidate. And what that also means is that because these guys are trying to hire locally in Columbia, South Carolina, they may just not find anybody and they may be forced to go remote. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities that where even a position that says it's not remote can become remote in digital marketing. Just to give you a scope of the opportunity in this field. Now, if you go over to Upwork, and we dig into the specific skill sets, you can see there's 15,000 search engine optimization roles, um, SEO content writer, which is a specific aspect of, of search engine optimization, which for a lot of you college grads who are good at writing, you wanna learn how to be SEO writers. Because the way you've learned to write in college, that's the academic style of writing, does not work in, in business. Nobody wants that style of writing. They want someone who can write catchy, uh, engaging content that Google likes. That's what, that's what SEO content is. And you can see there's an, almost 10,000 open jobs on Upwork. Um, Google Ads, which is again where most of my students get, uh, get jobs. There's 6,000 jobs in that. And again, you can see the hourly is like 20 to $53 an hour. Uh, it obviously varies from job to job, but you can see that's a lot more than the uh, customer service or the um, data entry jobs is more like you know twelve dollars an hour, and then of course Facebook ads where you can see the hourly can be even higher because again these ads are directly helping companies make money. That's why it's a more high value skill set and also why it takes a little bit longer to learn and implement and get confident in the skill set. Um, yeah, so that's what I have to say about digital marketing. Now the next. The next uh, skill set I actually jumped over to that in a moment would be web developer or WordPress developer. Now, web developer sounds a bit intimidating, but actually learning how to build a website using uh, WordPress in particular is actually not that difficult to do. I teach all my students how to build WordPress websites in my course. I've had students get clients for WordPress, paying them anything from $400 to $800 a month to maintain the website. And being a web developer and doing a little bit of coding is also something you can learn in a short amount of time. I don't teach like dedicated web development, but you can find boot camps and online courses that are very good. And you can see there are 25,900 open jobs. Also WordPress developer, like I mentioned before, WordPress is a CMS platform that essentially makes it very easy to install a website without knowing really any code at all. You can definitely learn. You can learn so much about WordPress and web development online and apply for any of these jobs here. Um, yeah, and this is, you know, we're in the, the world of, I would say the, you know, again, medium, medium skill set that is not, you know, pretty much anybody who really is a bit tech savvy and wants to learn how to do these things can do them. So the next like mid level skill set I recommend is bookkeeping. This is a non-technical skill set, but it is, is really an evergreen skill set because every company needs a bookkeeper, a bookkeeper. You guys don't know it's basically somebody who keeps track of all the expenses and expenditures of a company and they work with accountants to help basically say what did the company spend and how much money did they make and there's a there's a huge need for for bookkeepers and again it's not taught in college right so you people have to acquire this skill on their own and you can do this without uh, a degree and without any kind of licensure you don't you don't need any type of accreditation to be a bookkeeper um, you, you actually don't unless you know CPA if you want to be a certified public accountant, you need to have that certification but just to do bookkeeping you do not very similar with uh, web development digital marketing no degree is required um, so if you go over here to Upwork you're gonna see that's transcription hold on that's data entry and here's bookkeeping so there's about 4,900 jobs in bookkeeping if you go over to uh, bookkeeper in the United States there's about 4,900 remote jobs in uh, bookkeeping and I've known a lot of people who've started like very uh, successful freelance bookkeeping businesses. There's a friend of mine, Ben, uh, ben Robinson. He runs this bookkeeping uh, bookkeeper launch. And his course is very similar to mine in that he provides really practical advice. He's got a great community. He's got a lot of testimonials of people who have actually done this. Again, much more efficient than like going to college for something like this. 
Uh, so I definitely, if you like, you have to really like numbers. <laughs> you know, some people you might say, hey, I'm not so into computers, but I like numbers and, and business, then this would be more of a skill set for you. Finally, we get to tier three, which I call high skill, high pay. This is where it requires learning a very sophisticated skill. It can be done in months, but it really requires a lot of brain power. And the main skill sets here are basically it's software engineering or coding. Uh, and I actually just wanted to kind of use this as a way to frame and give you perspective on uh, tier two, the mid skill, which is to say that you can earn pretty much the same amount of money with digital marketing or bookkeeping as you could with coding, even though coding and being a software engineer is just a lot more sophisticated. I personally couldn't do it. It takes a lot of brain power. I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't handle it. Uh, so it's really this is really for a specific type of person who's very smart and very analytical and very good with with uh, with things you know with uh, mathematical concepts and things of that nature to learn uh, various uh, computer languages you know PHP uh, JavaScript C++ things like that and if you go over to LinkedIn you're gonna see like remote there's 119,000 remote digital marketing jobs based in the US so this is gonna pay very good uh, but you know you're going to need experience slash knowledge of some very sophisticated stuff. I mean, here like junior Java web developer for 12 months, React.js, uh, Bootstrap, uh, Spring Boot uh, Framework. You really need to learn some very, very uh, sophisticated stuff here. But there's a ton of jobs. And if you have the um, the capacity for it, you know, I was at a, I was at a, um, a workspace here in Koh Samui in Thailand and I met a couple of guys traveling. They were software developers. They were traveling around, living like digital nomads, and that's what they did for a living. They were like super smart and they were doing software development. Um, so I, I think, you know, this is a little bit prohibitive for a lot of people, which is why I focus on digital marketing. But again, if you have a aptitude for it, you know, don't don't get your master's degree in these in these topics. Go to a coding boot camp or go online. You can learn this stuff directly or definitely level up your skill sets. So I did just want to give you a quick a tip about this website Fiverr, which is ju just like Upwork, uh, but it's a little more, you know, engaging visually, and it's got there's tons of people on here looking for professionals providing services, especially digital services, digital marketing, graphics and design, writing and translation, video, all these other things, including programming. And one of the things you're going to find when you come on here, let's say I look for, I'm looking for a content writer, is that you are going to see a big difference. Uh, in price for a lot of people. So you're gonna see this person's charging $110, beginning at $110, this guy's charging 10 bucks. And so there's a tendency, I think, amongst people to get kind of like exacerbated by this and go, oh, exasperated and go, oh man, it's just like everyone, everything's so cheap, I can't make any money on here. But that's not the case. What you're gonna find is like, look how many reviews she has. And that's because quality service is actually the most valuable thing these days, especially with Google. You can pay somebody ten bucks or five bucks to write an article, but chances are it's not going to, it's not not going to be as valuable to a company and their website as it would be to pay a little bit more money for something that has uh, better quality to it. Especially with um, SEO content writing, basically you want articles that are written by native speakers that are going to make visitors to a website stay on the website longer, and that is how Google ranks and decides that it's a good website. So whether you are doing SEO content or Google ads or Facebook ads, or even if you're going to do you know, a programming gig, you just don't want to be intimidated about charging more money for a quality service. But also because you are a digital nomad, you could, let's say you're a native speaker who's a really good SEO writer, but you're living in uh, Bali instead of this person who is living in, let's see, where does it say? Where does she live? Well, she lives in uh, the United States. She's living in the United States, right? Maybe from Boston. So she's got much higher expenses than you have. So you could basically come in here and you could do basically provide what she's providing, which is high quality SEO content from a native like English speaker. And you could charge 50 bucks. And if you're living in Bali, you're still doing great, but you can basically undercut the competition because you're a digital nomad. Now there is more to being a digital nomad than just picking where you want to live and getting the skills and earning the income. But that those are the big, the big components. Another big component you're going to have to deal with if you're traveling internationally is visas. Um, if you've lived in the same country your whole life, like I had, you you know you never have to think about having permission to be in your own country. But once you're outside of your uh, borders, 
you need permission to be in other countries. And most of us just live as tourists, so we go in, and especially if you have a U.S. or European passport, it's very easy to get a, a visa on arrival in most countries. You can stay for 30 days, maybe even a little bit longer, but eventually you have to go home. If you want to spend a long period of time in another country, you'll have to investigate that country's long-term visa options. Now, the good news is that, again, in most of these countries where cost of living is lower, they make it quite easy for expats to stay because they want your frankly they want the income that you generate by being there um, I'm in Thailand where actually I think it's one of the more difficult countries to get a long-term visa they make it a little more difficult because frankly they know that this is a great place to be and a lot of people want to be here <laughs> so uh, but the, the point here is I'm not going to go into the details of visas because there's so many different countries but the point is you need to have your visa handled ahead of time or at least know basically how to do it you don't want to be in a foreign country and then suddenly realize, oh my God, I've overstayed or I'm in trouble or, you know, I have to figure this out while you're already over there. And then the last thing is going to be taxes. And I actually, you may have seen, I, I made another video called how to get a hundred thousand dollar tax break as a digital nomad. This is specifically for U.S. citizens, but there is a great tax advantage of being out of the U.S. for most of the year. Where, where, whatever country you're from and whatever your situation, you are going to still likely have to continue paying income taxes. Um, if you have a business based in your home country and you happen to be traveling or in a different location, you still are responsible for your domestic taxes, and that is between you and your tax professional. But again, it's that, these are the things that you actually have to deal with as a digital nomad. I know it's great when you see videos of people like you know in the ocean and doing fun stuff, but there is like actual business you have to take care of. One other thing you really need to be aware of as a digital nomad is how to avoid foreign transaction fees. These are fees that are extra that your bank will impose on you for basically doing business in a foreign country with a domestic bank. And it comes in th three uh, typical forms. Um, most credit and debit cards have a 3% fee on all international transactions. You can see here Bank of America assesses an international transaction fee uh, every time you use an ATM in a foreign uh, country with a foreign currency. And that also is the same for a lot of credit cards. Um, you also usually get dinged by the ATM itself with a fee as much as $6. That's what it's like here in Thailand. Every time you take money out, you get hit with your, your home bank's fees plus the $6, uh, which is 220 baht, uh, plus any currency exchange fees. And that has to do with the exchange rate. Now, right now, the U.S. dollar is very strong. In fact, uh, just to give you an example, like my $40,000 a month rent was as high as $1,300 a month U.S., but now the, the dollar is so strong, it's only eleven twenty nine uh, U.S. dollars. So in this particular situation, I'm in good shape with the currency, but there have been times where the bot is very strong, and now I have that, you know, a currency exchange means my money doesn't go as far over here. So you have to be aware of all three of these things, and there's a really easy way to take care of the first two things here. And the, basically what you need to do is search for a no foreign transaction fee credit card and just go on NerdWallet or any of these other websites. You got Bank of America, Capital One, uh, Chase, um, any of these other, any of these cards will do. Um, I personally uh, got this BlockFi uh, credit card. I am not a crypto guy at all. I don't like crypto, but uh, they had a really good cashback program, and again, there's no foreign transaction fee, and it's through Visa. So this is the one I picked. There's tons of cards, and just pick one so that every time, you know, if you're buying stuff and living overseas for a long period of time, 3% is, uh, it adds up. Um, and the way to get out of the ATM fees is through something called the Schwab High Yield Investor Checking Account. This debit card, Schwab, actually, this is kind of mind-blowing, they actually will rebate all of the uh, ATM fees from the foreign country. And if you look at my uh, checking account here, you're going to see these are all my ATM withdrawals. And then here's the rebate. So literally uh, every month you can see it's been as high as like 42 or bucks, 38 bucks, uh, 28 bucks, 21 dollars. It's been as high as like 50 or 100 dollars at times if I really needed to go to the ATM a lot. But every month uh, Schwab gives me that money back right into my account, which <laughs> I've never heard of any other bank doing that. So I think if you're going to be a digital nomad, um, you absolutely need to get this Schwab card. I'm not even affiliated with them. I just like to tell people about it because I think it's a really great business model. Make, you know, make people traveling to foreign countries happy. Um, I think it's awesome. So yeah, get yourself a no foreign uh, transaction fee credit card, the Schwab debit card, and you're going to be in a good shape to take care of at least two of these things. And then as far as the currency exchange, just be aware of it. 
you know, it fluctuates a lot. And just be aware of if your currency is stronger or weaker any given day. And I hope this, the logistics in this video, the specific details has helped you um, and given you a better, clearer understanding of what may be involved to become a digital nomad. And I hope it gave you a bit of inspiration and insight as well. And if you wanna learn more about my digital marketing course that's helped thousands of people get jobs in digital marketing with no previous experience or education since 2016, please click the link below and check out my free masterclass where I tell you more about the digital marketing industry and how it's possible to get a $60,000 a year job within one year if you gain these skill sets and take action. It is definitely possible. You can see I post testimonials from my students every week and you can do it too. And then once you have those skill sets, you just have so many options, including being a digital nomad. So I hope you found this video uh, to be helpful. And again, if you have questions or comments, please leave them below and I will see you in the next video.